with more than 120 tribes living in Tanzania. How has this country avoided the curse of tribalism, which so many African nations have fell victims to? The answer lies with this man. But by the time he stepped down as president, he had completely crushed the country and left it drowning in foreign debt. And somehow, to this day, he still earns the utmost respect from most Tanzanians. That's because he was sincere in his desire for Tanzania and Africa to be self-sufficient and not economic slaves to their former Western colonial masters. Though that dream has yet to be fully realized, his socialist approach pretty much removed tribalism from Tanzanian society. And as a result, Tanzania today stands as one of the most stable countries in Africa. And much of that credit goes to Malimu Julius Nyerere. In 1961, Tanzania broke free from the shackles of British colonial rule, igniting a transformative era in its history. Leading the charge was Julius Nyerere, a magnetic and visionary leader who assumed the mantle of the country's first president. With a steadfast belief in socialism and equality, Nyerere was determined to forge a self-reliant and fair society. Nyerere's introduction to socialism stemmed from his exposure to different ideologies during his studies in the United Kingdom. As a young student, Nyerere attended the University of Edinburgh, and it was during this time that he encountered socialist thinkers and began to develop an interest in their ideas. Nyerere's exposure to socialism was further reinforced by his involvement with the Fabian Society, a socialist organization that advocated for social justice and equality. Through his engagement with the Fabian Society, Nyerere delved deeper into socialist theories and ideologies, learning about concepts such as collective ownership, fair distribution of resources, and the importance of community. A big reason for why he easily took to socialism is because he was already exposed to much of the concepts in the culture he grew up in. But now, it was time to implement these socialist ideas on a national scale. He recognized the deep-rooted inequalities and disparities that existed in Tanzanian society, particularly between the urban and rural areas, and saw so socialism as a means to rectify these issues. I think there is a tendency in, uh, in the underdeveloped countries to think that uh, there is a shortcut to development, that countries can be developed for us by someone else. I'm saying this is, not, this is not possible, it has never happened. Denmark developed itself. It was not developed by someone else. Sweden developed itself. Not someone else went and developed Sweden for the Swedes. Uh, Norway developed itself. This is the, the United States developed itself. Britain had an empire, and an empire helped Britain in development. But we have no intention of establishing an empire anywhere. So, what we are trying to say is the, the basis of development is our own effort. After gaining independence in December 1961, Nyerere wasted no time in rallying the Tanzanian population towards a shared purpose. Communities across the country embraced principles of collective farming, fostering a spirit of cooperation and self-sufficiency. Simultaneously, education became a fundamental pillar of empowerment. Schools were established in even the most remote areas, ensuring that every Tanzanian, regardless of their background, had access to quality education and the opportunity to acquire valuable skills. This period was called the Ujamaa era. However, Nyerere's vision for unity and self-reliance extended beyond the borders of Tanzania. He firmly believed in the power of African solidarity and the need for collective action to overcome the challenges faced by the continent. As one of the founding fathers of the Organization of African Unity, now known as the African Union, Nyerere worked tirelessly to bring African nations together, and in some cases at the expense of his country's development. His unwavering support for the liberation movements in Southern Africa exemplifies this. He provided assistance and refuge to freedom fighters from countries such as Mozambique, South Africa, and Namibia. Nyerere also had a vision of a completely integrated East Africa. 
He was one of the driving forces behind the establishment of the East African community. He even offered to delay Tanganyika's independence to wait for Kenya and Uganda's independence in the hope of unifying the three countries. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but he did manage to unite Tanganyika and Zanzibar to create what we know today as Tanzania. Amidst his efforts to promote unity, Nyerere also recognized the importance of a common language that could bridge the diverse ethnic and linguistic backgrounds of Tanzanians. He saw language as a powerful tool for unifying the nation and fostering a sense of identity and belonging. With this in mind, Nyerere actively promoted Swahili as a unifying language. Swahili was already spoken by a significant portion of the population and Nyerere believed that making it the official language would help break down the communication barriers and promote inclusivity. By promoting Swahili, Nyerere aimed to create a sense of pride in the Tanzanian culture and heritage. He wanted every Tanzanian, regardless of their ethnic background, to feel connected to the nation and have equal opportunities for education and socio-economic advancement. As a result, Tanzanians can proudly hold their heads up high and say their national language isn't their colonial language. As Nirere's visionary Ujamaa policies were implemented, Tanzania faced both opportunities and challenges. Despite the initial enthusiasm and hope, the Ujamaa approach encountered obstacles that hindered its success. The collectivization of agriculture intended to promote communal ownership and cooperation often led to inefficiencies and reduced productivity. The forced relocation of rural communities to Ujamaa villages disrupted established ways of life, causing resentment and resistance among some Tanzanians. Also, the nationalization of industries and businesses resulted in increased government control, stifling private enterprise and hindering economic growth. As a result, Tanzania struggled with mounting foreign debt, a declining economy, and a lack of financial stability. These economic challenges, combined with internal dissent and external pressures, caused Tanzanians to become disillusioned with the Ujamaa experiment. In 1985, after more than two decades of leadership, Nyerere acknowledged the failures of his Ujamaa policies. He made the courageous decision to step down as president. His departure marked the end of an era and triggered a period of political transition for Tanzania. In stepping down, Nyerere demonstrated a rare display of leadership that placed the interests of the nation above personal power. He acknowledged that no leader is infallible and that true progress required adaptation and learning from mistakes. Nyerere's decision set a powerful precedent for a peaceful transfer of power in Tanzania, a crucial factor in the country's stability. On October 14, 1999, at the age of 77, Julius Nyerere passed away. He left a country that was united along ethnic and religious lines. Now, is that to say that some Tanzanians don't have negative opinions about each other and may even show favoritism towards their ethnic group? Of course not. But if you ask most Tanzanians today, they will most likely say that tribalism is far from a major concern in the country. Usually in life, you have to sacrifice one thing to gain the benefits of another. In this case, Nyerere unintentionally sacrificed slow economic progress and development for unity and cohesion. And today, Tanzania is one of the most peaceful and stable countries in Africa, whose economy is growing at a fast pace. So, maybe in the wider scope of things, the Ujamaa experiment wasn't so bad after all. <laughs>